Welcome to chapter 11 of Transgender Ideology and Gender Dysphoria, a Catholic Response. Uh, the, this topic is on the virtues. Uh, this is the final chapter of this book. If you would like a copy of the book, you have to look down below to the link and you can order it from Amazon or somewhere else. Uh, you can get digital or audio or hardcover, whatever you want. So we are jumping into virtues. Now this is not a short section, but in some ways it's a bit of a, a way in which I'm kind of teaching how to do Thomistic philosophy, theology in terms of ethical issues. So when you're dealing with ethical an ethical dilemma and you we would apply the virtues uh, to it. And this is kind of a walkthrough. So in some way, you know, it kind of covers more than what's needed. It's a bit excessive, really. This chapter is excessive. Not that the whole book isn't excessive, uh, being 800 and something pages in the digital book, uh, but it is, it is a very excessive section. So I'm going to kind of boil it down to the most basics, although if you really want a good lesson in um, uh, virtue, virtue ethics, uh, and morality, then, you know, the, the whole thing is good. Plus it's good to, it's very inspiring. Let's, you know, the virtues lift us up, uh, and that's, that's in here, but we won't go through every point in this video. Uh, so step four of the heuristic, right? We did, got good counsel. We got judgment, which was acting in the least invasive means, using uh, and attempting to restore nature uh, to our natural selves. And now it's command, it's the action, right? It's the application of the virtues, right? And there's two, we've got virtues and we've got grace, which is next, the last section. Uh, so there must be patience and acceptance of oneself, especially when one is born imperfectly. The penultimate happiness is the consequence of moral luck and moral virtues. Uh, of the two, the only one you have control over is virtue, right? So you don't have control over birth defects or things that are outside your control. You only have control over your own virtue. Uh, and use this, this quote here from Aristotle that God does not make mistakes. Nature does not make mistakes. Nothing is done idly, All right? Everything is for a reason. Uh, and with the practice of virtue, you know, we overcome some and we build character, right? So in general, right, the virtuous life, why virtues? Why are we applying virtues to this? Uh, Sister Mary Angelica Neenan points out, uh, true freedom is the ability to choose what is truly good. If God helps us to do that, then he is helping us to become more free, not obstructions not obstructing our freedom, right? This is freedom of excellence, uh, the Thomistic principle of freedom of excellence, where living according to the virtuous life, living according to n the natural law, leads us to greater freedom. The more we fight the virtues, right? The more we go down vice, the less happy we will be. The more we fight our own nature, the less happy we'll be, right? Uh, this is our our our. Our fundamental flaws is moving against uh, our own nature and against the virtues. Uh, Father Livio Molina points out the heart of virtue is love, right? So why are we doing virtue in response to this? Well, the heart of virtue is love, right? Um, and St. Thomas, when he writes on charity, says our love, right, our charity, is friendship with God, right? The enjoyment of God himself, right? Abiding in God which then extends out to love of neighbor, right? So it's all about friendship, right? So this is why it's different than some of the other religious approaches to dealing with the transgender issue, right? If you look at some of the kind of evangelical approaches or some Catholic approaches, um, where it's like, where the thought is, well, God can just heal you of all this and, you know, pray it away or something like that. This isn't really... You know, this is the type of thing that kind of leads to greater depression, greater senses of guilt and things like that. But that shouldn't be true of the virtuous life, right? So just like 
somebody's an alcoholic and they go through the 12 steps. You don't hear about huge numbers of suicide because of the 12 step program, right? The 12 step program is not an abusive uh, heuristic, right? It's not an abusive heuristic. This is not an abusive heuristic. It can't be abused because at the heart of it is to live a virtuous life. And, virtu and living a virtuous life is only helpful, right? It's, you know, it's like going through the 12 steps and it's like make amends with people who you've wronged. That's not going to lead to, lead to suicide, right? That, the, at the very nature of healing, right? So the same thing with here, right? It's not denying nature. It's not denying anything. It, it is focusing on that which is good, right? That which is the best. It is living in love, right? This is not self-destructive. This is so it's only going to help, right? Is it going to magically solve all of your problems? No, right? It's not a magical cure. It's not a miracle. It's uh, it's virtue, right? It's infused virtue. It's the practice of virtue. Uh, now, Alistair McIntyre pointed out, uh, he says, you know, he's an Aristotelian. He points out, uh, we have to ask these questions in terms of virtue first one, who am I, right, and kind of key to virtue ethics is character, who, who am I, what are, what are you about, second, uh, what behavior will lead me uh, to be what I ought to become, right, what behavior, thinking about action, right, so being and then action, action, right, so being, action follows being, being creates, uh, actions, right? So they go hand in hand. And lastly, what kind of community can help me to achieve this goal? These are three very good questions. And this isn't, these aren't even just questions for the transgender community. The, again, these are the questions we should all be asking. Who am I? What, are, what type of behavior would lead me to be the person I ought to become? And what type of community will get me there? Right? I tend to think that the Catholic Church is particularly strong on this, right? Uh, you know, do most people really love everything the church says on morality? Not usually. Usually it's a challenge, right? It's not telling us what we want to hear, right? It's one of these things that the, the church tells us the truth even when it's unpopular, right? It tells us to live a certain way even when that's not what society is telling us we should want, right? It's, uh, you know, the most powerful people in the church are poor, chaste, and obedient, right? This is not, <laughs> this is not what you want to hear as you move up the chain of command, right? Um, the church doesn't tell you what you want. It helps you become the person you ought to become, right? I think there's a lot of truth in that with the church, right? That some of the other denominations, it's like, well, whatever you want, right? We're not going to tell you who to do, be or what to think or what to say. You know, if you say, well, what do you believe on the Eucharist? Well, we don't, you know, whatever you want to think about that. Well, what do you think about, uh, you know, the resurrection? Well, it could be symbolic. It could be, you know, literal. Well, how about the incarnation? Well, in some ways, we're all incarnate, right? They try to not offend anyone, so they say nothing, right? So the consequences, you know, it doesn't really challenge us, right? If anything, the Catholic Church challenges us, right? And it knows the challenging things, and it doesn't back down from the challenging things, right? It, it makes very bold statements of what to believe and how to believe it and to what degree to, to believe it, right? Our model is the martyrs, right? Uh, right, so it, it, in some ways, you know, it, what's going to get you there? Is it going to be being part of a kind of LGBT community, or does the real challenge put forth by the church going to help you become the person you ought to become? And is that consistent with who you say you are, right? What type of person do you want to be? I think another part of this, I don't want to dwell on it too long, but, you know, if the thing you're saying is who, do, who am I and what do I want to become, if you're thinking, well, I want to be rich and I want to be handsome and I want to be uh, a world traveler and I want to be powerful and I want to have you know, everybody envious of me. You could want this, but is it going to lead to your happiness, right? I think this is a, a challenge, 
right? This first part is a big challenge to us, right? You have to know who you are and know who you ought to become um, right, for the virtuous life. I think again the church challenges on ch challenges us on that right because who ought we to become Christ-like right that's uh, that's it now how about uh, meaning versus pleasure and I think this is important to put in here although maybe it could be in other sections as well but the Viktor Frankl right he's a Holocaust survivor Jewish therapist and he writes in the book man's search for meaning and his point is that you know if you're looking for pleasure you know get a good glass of wine right <laughs> as, as c.s lewis points out it's like if if i wanted to be a if i wanted comfort uh, i didn't become a christian for comfort if i wanted a comfort i could just go to a good glass of port right <laughs> christianity challenges us um well, Victor Frankl has a similar perspective, right? You know, pleasure is fine to a certain degree, but what's really going to get you through the hard times, what's really going to get you through life is meaning, not pleasure, right? Or even happiness, right? It's, it's going to be meaning. He points out, uh, one may find experience of joy within the present, within their present situation, okay? One must attempt to make a positive difference in the world, and Finally, one must have the right attitude, be optimistic about changing things that can't be changed, and accept those things that can accept those things that cannot be changed. Right? That's the serenity prayer. All right. So, can you find any sense of joy in the current moment? And can you attempt to make a positive difference in the world? And can you change the things that can be changed, and and accept the things that cannot? Right. This is how you have a meaningful life, according to Victor. Frankel, right? Can you find any sense of joy in the concentration camp, in your situation? If you can't, you're never, you're not going to find meaning, and you won't ultimately find happiness, right? Um, this is this is important, right? Because right now we're in a kind of an age where it's like, well, I'm not happy, I'm not content, I'm not. You know, people are making a hundred thousand dollars a year, and they have perfect health, and they're young, and they say they're not happy well uh, if you can't find joy in that then you, what's the chances you're going to find joy under a more difficult so, so set of circumstances um, right faith uh, so jumping into the virtues so we start with the theological virtues faith hope and love these are the object of these is God so in some ways they're not the most important when we're dealing with gender dysphoric people specifically right these are faith hope and love are overarching over all human beings and they kind of affect us all evenly in some sense right because it's dealing with upper level stuff right it's dealing with god um so whether you're black or white male female trans whatever you are right th this is top level stuff so it's not going to matter about the individual nonsense that you're in within <laughs> within your life right it doesn't matter if you're american or venezuelan faith hope and love right it's just beyond all of those distinctions right so the very they're the most important however they're also the least relevant to the transgender issue in some ways so faith is uh the ascent to believe uh the ascent, the ascent of the believer to the things which are proposed to him. So, you know, the the priest comes and says, "I believe in one God, the Father Almighty." Right? He has proposed to you the faith. Right? Uh, he's preached a homily. I propose to you the faith. Do you say Amen? Right? Do you assent to the faith that was proposed? Right? The missionary comes and tells you about Jesus. The incarnation, the miracles, suffering, death, resurrection. Do you say amen? Right. This is the faith. Right. It's assenting to the thing proposed to you. Right? That's faith. Now, hope is trust in the divine assistance for obtaining everlasting happiness. Right. Eternal happiness, eternal life. Uh, so, trust in the divine assistance. Right. It's two parts. Trusting in God 
to obtain everlasting life, right? That's what hope is. Right? Is it particular to the transgender issue? Mm. Not so much, right? There's also the there's also the non-theological virtue of hope as well, and that is more relevant because it's a, a natural virtue, which you know, the result of hoping in. Oh, I, I hope I pass my test or something like this, right? Something that you could achieve yourself through your own human uh, efforts, right? That you, with the, as a result of your own efforts, you can achieve this. This is properly, you know, the, the non-theological version of hope. This type of hope can only be achieved with divine assistance. You can't achieve it on your own, no matter how hard you try. So. The other type of hope, right, the natural hope, that is more rele relevant because you say, I hope this surgery will make me happy, right? I hope these hormones will make me happy. I hope when I become a woman, I will be, I'll be satisfied, right? And if you don't get this hope, the result is despair, right? Uh, so you hope if you're successful, then it's happiness. And if it's not, it's despair. Right? And this is relevant to the transgender issue because, again, you're hoping for these things. If it comes true, you're happy. But the question is, can it come true? Or is this uh, kind of dreams in the sky, right? Hopes in the sky. Uh, and lastly, charity. Now, this one does have more of an effect because charity itself, being the greatest of all virtues, um, perfects all of the virtues, right? So all of the moral virtues, all of the cardinal virtues are perfected by charity. So because everything is perfected by charity, charity becomes very relevant to everything. So St. Augustine says charity, uh, it says there's four kinds of charity that man must love. God first, right? That's the first. Uh, another is uh, in him love of self. The next is love of neighbor. And the fourth is love of body. It's really in that order, right? Love of God, love of self, love of neighbor, love of body. And what is charity? Charity is uh, the love of God uh, for God's own sake, not for what you can get out of God. Right? It's loving God for God's own sake. Uh, and it's the enjoyment of God, right? What is God doing all day long? What is God doing all day long? Enjoying himself. <laughs> that's, that's what God's doing all day long, enjoying himself. Well, what do we do when we have perfected charity, right? We have perfect charity. We are enjoying God too, right? We are enjoying God. Abiding in God, we are enjoying God, which then extends our friendship with God, then extends to God's other friends, which are our neighbors, right? So because we love God, we love ourselves because we're God's friend. And we love our neighbors because our neighbors is, is also God's friend. So we can love God who abides in ourselves. So then we have self-love. And we love our neighbor who God abides in. Right. So we love the God in our neighbor for the sake of God, not for their own sake. Right? It, it, let's say you like your neighbor for their own sake. Well, that's philia, right? It's a different type of love, right? You say, I just love all of humanity. Uh, that can be agape, right? That's a different type of love. Say, so, yeah, I have a sexual love for my spouse. Eros, different type of love. This is charity, right? Caritas. Uh, so this type of love is the enjoyment of God, the, the abiding in God and the love of neighbor through God, right? So then it's love of God, love of self, love of neighbor, love of body. So this can apply here, right? Um, because if you say, I hate my body, right? It doesn't reflect me. You ought to. You ought to like your body. Um, why? Because God created it, and if God loves it, you, sh you should love it too, right? It's the extension of caritas, right? It's an extension of caritas that you should love your body, right? If you say you don't like yourself, well, if you are God's friend and God abides in you, you should like yourself, right? Uh, 
love of neighbor, same thing, right? You should, you should, right? Uh, it, it's illogical not to, right? It, it, it violates reason to not love them. Right? God loves them. You can't be the enemy of God's friend, right? Even if that's yourself, right? You can't be the enemy of God's friend. Um, Archbishop Carlson uses this kind of charity talk in his pastoral letter, Archbishop of St. Louis. He points out, if you are uncomfortable with your biological sex, or if you consider yourself as having a gender identity at odds with your biological sex, here's the first thing I want you to know. God loves you. He loves you right where you are. He has a plan for you. Right? Caritas, that's what we're talking about here, right? But I hate myself, but I don't like my body, right? God loves you, just as it is. And he has a plan for you, right? So chill out, <laughs> right? But I don't feel comfortable. Pray, discern, practice the virtues, love your neighbor, love God, serve, right? It'll work out, <laughs> right? Uh, we are very, we think we're very in control of things, right? Uh, we make plans, God laughs, right? But I'm a woman, but I'm a this. Just wait, just pray, live virtuously, serve, right? might find a sense of happiness that you didn't know otherwise, right? Uh, this is the idea of charity. Now this is applied again to all the virtues, all your actions, caritas. Because it's abiding in God, it's the enjoyment of God for his own sake. It's friendship with God, right? You're not going to kill yourself when you have friendship with God. When you're enjoying God, right? Why would you kill yourself if you're in the enjoyment of God? Uh, if you're abiding in God, you're not going to kill yourself. Right? Uh, now, prudence. Right? And now we're getting into the cardinal virtues. Prudence is an intellectual virtue, the only intellectual virtue. Because if you think about it, prudence is like a road map. It's saying, for all the other virtues, how do I make a more just society? Well, you have to be prudent about how you make a just society. Therefore, we're talking about an intellectual virtue. Uh, in this regard, right? The other ones are moral virtues, right? So the other cardinal virtues are moral virtues that's dealing with like a middle ground, right? Mor moral virtues all have an extreme and there's a moderate middle ground. Prudence, there is no extreme of prudence, right? Be infinitely prudent, right? There's, there's, there's no failure in being infinitely prudent. Um, again, it's the map. It's, it, and it's the one of the most important of all virtues, right? It's uh, it's the most important of the cardinal virtues. If you don't have prudence, you're not going to have anything else, right? Another way of looking at prudence as well is practical wisdom, right? Phrenesis, being able to know the mind of God, right? And to be wise, to be a wise person. What Solomon prayed for. Yep, he says... Uh, Catechism says, the virtue that disposes the practical reason, right, phronesis, practical wisdom, uh, to discern our true good in every circumstance and to choose the right means of achieving it, right? It's how to get there, how to get to the end. It doesn't tell you what your end is, just how to get to your end, right? So justice might tell us what our end is, but prudence tells us how to get there. Um, well, there's different parts of prudence. I break this all down in the chapter, but you have memory, which deals with past things that have happened, right? Learning from the past. There's intel, in, uh, understand, I'll just do it in English. There's understanding, which is understanding the present moment, right? To, to know what's going on. There's teachableness, right? Learning from others. You either have experienced it yourself and you've learned from it, or you could learn from other people, right? Uh, if you can learn from history, that's good. Right? There's a shrewdness or a wisdom. A, you know, you're not going to get taken for a ride by a charlatan if you have this shrewdness, um, ratio, right, right reason, right. You can think things correctly. Uh, very close to prudence is providencia, right, foresight, right. You see what's coming down the road, and you can 
uh, make projections, right? And uh, this is very important, right? It's like driving down the road and you see that trash truck up ahead and it's doing something. You think that thing might just cut right out in front of me. So because you have the foresight, you slow down, right? You give some space and then they do a U-turn and they, they would have killed you. But you had foresight, right? Because you have seen people drive before and you realize sometimes people do stupid things. So you give space, right? This is foresight. The youth do not have foresight, right? Some A new driver just keeps driving even though, you know, it's not wise, right? It's not wise. And they go, well, I had the right away. Well, that's nice, but you could still end up dead, right? Because this is what wisdom <laughs> would tell us, right? Uh, foresight. Circumspection, right? What is the possibilities? What's within the range of possibilities? And caution, knowing when to slow down and to gather more information, to uh, consider the things more, right? So all of the they're brilliant. We could spend hours on each one of them, but <clears throat> they're all important. And a big piece of prudence is that people who are prudent, people who should be prudent, are older people who have more life. It's not book knowledge, but it's people who have learned lessons with time, right? It's a, a mensch, right, in the Jewish term, a Yiddish term, a mensch, you know, a wise person, a grandmother, a grandfather, right? Uh, they're not going to be, they might be deceived by technology, but they're not going to be deceived about people, right? They know people. <laughs> Uh, grandparents um, from their time. So this is why prudence is very important, perhaps the most important virtue in terms of the transgender issue, because a lot of the, the growth of the transgender movement has been teenage girls, right? Teenagers. What do teenagers not have? Prudence, because little children don't have any prudence, and teenagers are only starting to learn prudence, right? They're at the step one, they're imprudent, right? Which is why we don't let young teenagers, 13 year olds, have guns or get tattoos or uh, go to war, right? It's not that their bodies aren't physically strong enough, it's just we say they, they're not, they don't have the, the mind for it. Well, we're not saying they're stupid, they're just imprudent, right? They don't know, right? Why, why don't we let them drink at 13 years old? Because they don't know what they're doing with that, right? You have to have more experience with life. Right? You have to have, develop some level of prudence, either from your own experiences or from others. Um, right? So this is a very important one. Another one is justice, right? This is another very important virtue. And um, it's all these different elements, right, the supported parts of justice, but um, is giving each their due, right? So in a civil society, it's giving society their due. When they were talking about God, it's giving God one's due, that's religion. Um, giving our parents what's due, our nation what's due, our friends what's due, right? It's giving each individual what is due to them. Well, how does this apply to justice? Well. We have to act fairly with recta ratio, right? Right reasoning. So when it's dealing with transgender people, again, more so for the young than for the old, we have to give them what is due to them, which is being a parent or being an adult, to being a person who is wise, who can make good decisions. It's unjust to let kids run wild right spoiled brat right that, that's that's unjust right that's not helpful likewise and i brought this up many times in this book this idea that we do don't judge our equals within society is also important right i mentioned affability a number of times right here it is on this list here friendliness what is our attitude towards the transgender barista at our starbucks friendliness what is due in my relationship to the barista at Starbucks? Friendliness, right? That's what's due, right? Uh, well, should I tell them that they're part of an ideology? And that, right? Truthfulness is in here, right? But what I really owe to them more than anything is friendliness. Right? 
Now, if I'm a parent, what do I owe to my child? Not friendliness in the same way, right? I might have to do things which is not uh, nice, <laughs> right? It's not uh, enjoyable, right? It can be downright confrontational. But this is what you have to do when you are a parent, right? You have to be confrontational because you owe a different responsibility to your children than you do to the barista at Starbucks, right? Does it mean you love one more, one more than another? Not really, right? But it's everything in its right place at its right time and its right order, right? This is very important for the common good, right? We don't talk about these things anymore, but the common good is very important, right? And if everything goes accordingly, everything is met, right? But I'm not the center of the universe that needs to solve everybody else's problems, right? Or to be judging the whole world, right? This is why like Christians often get called judgmental because well, look at them judging. Well, if you're talking about me judging my neighbor, then you're right. I'm a, I'm a usurping of power. I'm, I'm wrong. If you mean the bishop made a statement about abortion, well, this is not judgmental. This is uh, this is within their authority to to instruct us on moral matters, right? This is what a bishop is supposed to do. You know, if you say, well, I don't agree with them and I'm not going to listen to them, well, then that's okay. You don't accept their authority, which would mean you're not Catholic, and it's a free world, right? You have free will not to be a Catholic if you don't want to. But, um, but it's their job as the bishop of the diocese to act with authority on issues of morality, right? And, right? You don't like your parents giving you authority when you're uh, over 18. You don't have to talk to them, but it's still the job of a parent to be a parent, right? So uh, justice is, is important as well, right? Fortitude is another one. So fortitude, courage, right? The moral virtue that ensures firmness in difficulties and constancy in the pursuit of the good, right? It strengthens the resolve to resist temptation and the and to overcome obstacles in the moral life. Right? This is a very important one as well, right? It also overcomes the irascible, right? That which is difficult, that which is a challenge to us, right? You have to look at Zelensky in Ukraine, right? He's overcoming. Uh, Russian occupation, right? This is difficult. It's a challenge. Uh, he could easily run away, but he is pursuing the good when it's hard, right? It, 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 he has fortitude because it strengthens his resolve for the temptation of running away, and he overcomes the obstacles of wanting a comfortable life, right? Fortitude, right? The virtue of fortitude. And we all acknowledge he has fortitude, right? He is virtuous and heroic because of his fortitude. Right? This makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, Cesario, Father Cesario points out, it controls the unruly emotions uh, that pose a serious threat to maintaining our watchful prudence, right? We have a plan, we have a path, we have a way we're going. Fortitude keeps us on the path, right? Obstacles come up, it keeps us on the path. So. And lastly, I'll do this before I do the overview of it. Uh, you know, Western cultures, we deal with the issue of effeminacy a lot. Effeminacy, right? And it just doesn't mean female, right? It's kind of, you think of it as a feminine man, right? Effeminacy. But not exactly that, right? It's, it's in a Thomistic sense, um, it's a man who is accustomed to enjoying pleasure. It is difficult for him to endure uh, the lack of pleasures, right? So you can be, be a real strong, tough guy, but you're a wimp when it comes to doing something hard, right? You just like to golf and drink beer and, you know, watch pornography or something like that, right? Because you don't have to be feminine. You don't have to be, like the opposite of masculine, right? You don't have to be feminine in that regard, but you, you know, just weak, right? Just a weak-willed person, right? And this is, can be true for women too, right? There's women who are, you know, mama bear, right? <laughs> Taking care of her kids. And then there's the girl who, you know, 
afraid of a spider and you know she can't do anything right she needs somebody to save her right there's men and women that are like that and there's men and women who have fortitude right? so it's not a gender thing necessarily so this is the problem with the feminacy today right and it's the problem of the lack of fortitude today so if you say well but i'm you know i'm not comfortable with something right i'm not comfortable Right, so I'm going to change my sex, or I'm non-binary. I'm, I'm not comfortable. I'm not, you know, uh, I don't want to be masculine. I don't want to be the, you know, it's this wishy-washiness, right? If you have assented to the faith, right, you've assented to the faith, you've essentially signed up for martyrdom, right? You've assigned up for it. With hope, you, you depend on divine assistance for everlasting happiness, which is, again, part of accepting martyrdom, right? That's part of the hope, even, if, even unto death, right? Unto death, you depend on the divine assistance. And you're willing to abide in God and in God's enjoyment, right? Primarily, above, above anything else, right? You pick God. Um, you're on this journey towards God, to abide in God perfectly, right? You're, you're on this journey. Don't let anything get in the way, right? Say, but I feel this way, but I feel that way. But, you know, this has happened, right? We make a lot of excuses for why we can't continue on the journey. But this is the journey to everlasting life, <laughs> right? This will, this will be where the conservative part of me comes out in this section here, right? What is more, as I pointed out last time, what is more important as a Catholic man? Fidelity to the covenant of your marriage or doing what you feel like. The covenant of your marriage, right? That surpasses doing what you feel like, right? Because the image is, is from the letter of St. Paul, right? It's a man joins with, with a woman and the two become one flesh. And as Christ marries the church you marry the woman um well how did christ marry the church through his crucifixion right so this is a similar thing here right uh it's an absolute commitment right a total commitment well the same thing with with uh your faith life right what would you allow to get in the way of everlasting life fully enjoying god abiding in charity right is there anything that would, you would say, oh, but I have to, you know, be me, right? I got to be me, right? You know, I got to do what makes me happy, right? I have to, you know, be true to myself, right? These things that people say, right? If tr being true to myself, whatever that means, uh, being me, whatever that means, finding my own happiness, whatever that means, is more important than abiding in God an everlasting life, then your proportion's off, right? You've fallen off the journey, right? You have fallen off the path. What keeps us on the path? Fortitude, right? Uh, if you've never had the, if you've never started the path, fortitude isn't going to do anything for you because you're not even on the path. But if you're on the path, fortitude, right? Last of the cardinal virtues, temperance, right? So temperance is the moral virtue that moderates attractions and pleasures and provides a balance in the use of created goods. Uh, the temperate person directs the sensitive appetites, appetites towards what is good and maintains a healthy discretion. Uh, typically, temperance means moderation in terms of food, alcohol, and sex, right? These are the sensitive appetites things that we go after, right? You could even say sleep and things like that, right? They're things of pleasurable senses. Um, well, does, does this apply to the transgender issue? It kind of does, right? It, it actually, it kind of does. Not in terms of food, sex, and uh, drink, but if we look back to the DSM-5, right? What does, how do we define gender dysphoria? A strong desire, a strong desire, a strong desire, a strong desire, a strong conviction. We're talking about primarily desire, right? Like desires of the flesh, right? Desires of uh, food, drink, and sex, right? How do we... Are, are our desires unnatural? 
well know, right, uh, that people want to eat and drink and have sex are very natural. Right? <laughs> the desires are natural. But what if uh, this desire to eat is 10,000 or 12,000 calories a day? Now, that's not good, right? What if the sexual desire is to somebody else's wife? Not good. What if your drink is... Uh, uh, 20 cans of beer, right? It's, uh, that is not good, right? This is the, not the right path. Uh, this is an excessive amount of these things, right? So desires need to be held in check, right? They need to be balanced by rectoratio, right? Right reasoning, right? What is the right amount of food? I don't know, 1,200 calories or whatever it is, depending on your age and height and sex, right? What is the right amount of alcohol? Well, probably nothing or very little, right? Not much, you know. Uh, right? What is the right uh, amount of sex? Well, with your spouse you're married to within the context of marriage, right? This is, um, there's, it's, the things can be good, but that's to the right rectoratio, right? Right reasoning. And this is all to balance our desires, which the things we desire ultimately are good for us, but only when held to the light of rectoratio, right? So the same would be true for the transgender issue, right? So you have a desire that's boiling up inside of you. <clears throat> what do you do with desire? You hold it to the light of reason, right? When it's held to the light of reason, you judge the desire. All desires good? No. <laughs> right? So you hold it to the light of reason. If the desire is good, right? I haven't eaten all day and I'm hungry. Well, then you should probably eat, right? <laughs> That's what right reason would say, right? Um, if it's, oh, I think I should get uh, cosmetic surgery to make me look like the opposite uh, sex. Okay, let's hold that to right reason, right? Let's put that to the light. Simply desiring it doesn't make it right. right. Hold it to the light of reason. Now, what's the light of reason in regards to the transgender issue? I don't know. Look at the previous ten chapters. Right? I'm not going. We can't relitigate that all over again. But uh, at least the last chapter, chapter ten, might give some insights. Lastly, one of my spiritual advisors pointed out that I should consider mercy in itself, in and of itself. Now, this is not one of the um, cardinal virtues. It's not one of the theological virtues, right? So it's kind of on its own. It's not one of the seven. But mercy is part of uh, charity, right? And so charity is the greatest virtue. And of charity, mercy is a virtue. And it's the greatest virtue of the virtue, right? So uh, if charity is abiding in God, right, and the enjoyment of God and the abiding in God, the love of God, which then extends to neighbor, right? This is the, this is the best, right? This is the queen of all virtues. Uh, from this comes an action, right? And, and this St. Thomas takes this line from St. Augustine, right? He says, Mercy is heartfelt sympathy for another's distress, impelling us to help them if we can. Right? So if you love God and neighbor, then it should manifest itself in external acts. When St. Thomas debates, he says, well, is mercy different than charity? And he kind of says, no, they're not really different, right? Mercy is just the acting out of charity. That's all mercy is, right? So... You can have charity without it acting it out, right? Because let's say your neighbor isn't in any type of need, right? You can still have charity. But mercy is always in charity. And Archbishop Carlson, he points out, he says, very simply, these are our brothers and sisters. We have been subject, they have been subjected to violence and harassment, which is a violation of their human dignity. We, for our part, must protect them, welcome them into our hearts, reach out to them in love, just as Jesus did, whether or not we make 
uh, whether or not we totally understand their experience and whether or not we agree with their decisions they make. They need to find us offering a safe space in which they can experience the love of God. Mercy. Right? This is mercy. Another one, St. Pope Francis points out in the, about evangelization, says, the gaze of Jesus and... Uh, he begins with the gaze of Jesus and they spoke of how he looked upon the women and men whom he met with love and tenderness, accompanying them, uh, accompanying their steps in truth, patiently and patient, patience and mercy as he proclaimed the demands of the kingdom of God. Right. So again, patience, mercy, tenderness. Right. This is the approach uh, that we take. Right. Archbishop Carlson also points out, and I didn't put the quote on here, but he says, we start with mercy and we end with mercy, right? But in the middle, there's got to be more, right? If we, yes, we, we say love and accept everyone, but sometimes we have to make difficult decisions, right? So we do still have to consider more than mercy. It's not just mercy alone ever. But if we really want to help people, right, we have to be knowledgeable about something in order to help, right? can be well-intentioned and make things worse, right? I think that might be what's happening and a lot of times is a lot of well-intentioned people are making things worse because they haven't considered the facts, right? They haven't considered what's really going on. But as Catholic people, we should have heartfelt sympathy for transgender people and it impels us to help wherever we can. Now I'm going to pick this up, tying it into grace as well. So I'm just going to leave mercy where it is from here not really dealt with mercy, but grace is a short section, and I think mercy ties in very well with grace, so we'll pick it up from there. Okay, have a great rest of your day.